I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University, hosting another segment of Dialogue on Public Issues. Today, I'm very pleased to be hosting Josh Crawford, the Executive Director of the Pegasus Institute, headquartered in Louisville. Josh, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, and then we'll delve into uh, discussion of the Institute. Well, uh, I hope that your viewers won't hold this against me, but I was born and raised in uh, Massachusetts, uh, went to college in Pennsylvania, uh, moved back to Massachusetts for law school, uh, moved here to Kentucky about four years ago after being a prosecutor in California. Well, uh, a rather secure this route to get to Kentucky. What, what uh, attracted you to Kentucky? Am I, was it the Institute? It was. So our previous executive director uh, was a gentleman named Jordan Harris, who you've had on before. Um, yes. Jordan, Jordan was my best friend, is my best friend, uh, was the best man in my wedding, uh, is a native Kentuckian, uh, and uh, was in the process of planning to move back to Kentucky. I was working for a think tank in Massachusetts at the time, uh, and the idea had been to him about starting a think tank in Kentucky, but he was advised that if he were to do so, he needed to find somebody to do it with. And so that's mm -hmm. when I got a phone call uh, that suggested that I make the move to Kentucky. And obviously, as as you alluded to, that's uh, quite the different place from, from where I grew up or where I was living at the time. But after months of conversations, obviously made the decision to, to move here. Well, we're very pleased to have you as a native Kentuckian. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have uh, you and others who move into the Commonwealth and, and uh, add to uh, the give and take, and the, particularly in the public policy arena, uh, the Institute has uh, brought a great deal uh, to the table. What is the mission uh, and a little bit of the history you've alluded to of the Pegasus Institute? Yep, so we were founded in, in 2016, uh, and our goal is to, to provide public policy research that improve the lives of all Kentuckians. Um, we set out four years ago uh, to do research in areas that we had expertise in, that we could provide commentary on, and to sort of serve as a bridge between the academic community uh, and political life here in the Commonwealth. And uh, that, that mission has guided us through these last four years, but we have expanded the issue areas that we work in as the, uh, the Institute itself has grown both in terms of staff and individuals who are affiliated with us as fellows. Um, so we now do a, a whole array of policy work uh, in addition to those core four areas that we started out with. I think uh, in interviewing your predecessor, I recall that he described it in part as a group of millennials, at least in the beginning. Now I know that everyone involved is not a millennial, but uh, has that been a part of the uh, background of the mission? Yeah, so we are the, the first millennial founded and run think tank in the country. Uh, I'm 30, uh, Jordan's 31. Uh, most of my staff uh, are my age or younger. Uh, a number of our fellows who are, are tenured professors or, or previously were professors at universities, uh, they are very much not millennials, uh, but the, the sort of perspective that we brought to the table was informed by being a part of that generation. Uh, it makes us a little bit more uh, flexible and innovative, perhaps, in the way we utilize things like technology. Um, it actually, from my perspective, made this coronavirus period, I think, much easier for us than it, it did for some of our um, uh sort of comparable organizations across the country that are sort of older. Um, we grew up with technology. Uh, like I said, some of these are even younger and and really don't know a world without the internet. And so for, for a lot of us transitioning to sort of the virtual office space uh, was probably easier because of that. Does the uh, Institute bring an ideological perspective to the uh, public policy table? Yeah, so I think it is fair for us to be categorized as conservative or free market mm -hmm. or depending on the issue that, that we lean a particular way. I'm of the belief that the way that we actually um, move public policy forward 
is rather than trying to to hide our worldviews or or pretend as if they don't exist, is to acknowledge those things, put them at the forefront, and say that this is the perspective through which I approach this work. Uh, ultimately, all of our work relies heavily on what the data says, but but I absolutely put that data through a conservative worldview. That being said, uh, I've got employees that. Uh, are sort of Rockefeller Republican types. I've got employees that are more libertarian. Uh, I've got at least uh, two individuals who work with us who would would categorize themselves as liberals. Um, and so it's it's more about the quality of work, and the ability to do work, than it is the ideology. But to the extent that the institute has an uh, theological bend, it is a rightward bend. But we are fiercely and ferociously nonpartisan. Uh, I am just mm-hmm. as likely. Democrats on issues as I am Republicans. Has uh, the Institute done any research on the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on the economy of Kentucky and on the state budget? Absolutely. So um, our website, which is uh, pegasuskentucky.org, actually has a specific COVID-19 tab on it now that folks can go to. And Essentially, what we did for a large part of the initial sort of lockdown phase of COVID was to say, what if we put all of these issues that we work on through the prism of coronavirus? So uh, we care deeply about jail crowding. What's the impact on jail crowding of coronavirus? We care deeply about violence here in Louisville. What's the impact of coronavirus on violence here in Louisville? We care deeply about K through 12 education. So what's the impact on K through 12 education? And then uh, the budget taxes uh, and unemployment were, were three of the big economic questions uh, that are a result of that. Um, we early on had one of our senior fellows do some projections that basically just said if economic impact was half as bad as the Great Recession, what would that look like for the budget? If it was as bad as the Great Recession, what would it look like for the budget? And if it were twice as bad as the Great Recession, what would it look like for the budget? And in all of those circumstances, Kentucky found itself uh, in it with a pretty dire projection. One of the sort of ways that policy uh, influences these these sort of an always evolving situation is the additional six dollars in federal unemployment benefits and the taxes generated from those benefits uh, actually appear to be increasing uh, or at least leveling off revenues in a way that in their absence the 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 cut the the carve out or the the, the detriment there would be probably more severe. And so it, it, it's really going to be hard to tell until legislators gavel in to actually craft a one-year budget in January what the budget situation is. And so it appears that those months with that additional federal benefit, that the tax receipts are actually okay, they're, they're, they're not significantly detrimented. But the longer that these uh, sort of coronavirus restrictions are in place, especially in the absence of those kind of uh, federal programs, uh, the the bigger the budgetary impact likely will be. And so we'll have a better idea uh, when everybody has a better idea, which is when legislators sit down to actually craft that budget. Recently, uh, Pegasus uh, authored a report. Uh, I think you actually authored it. Uh, uh, titled Declaring an Emergency, Cross-State Comparisons and Recommendations for Reform. Uh, yep. What was the purpose of the report and some of the major recommendations uh, sure. coming out of that sure. report? Yeah, so one of the things that I'm always on the lookout for is unique opportunities to research. Um, one of the things that we care a lot about uh, as an organization is bail, um, bail reform, pretrial release. And so we were living through a time period where um, there were sort of unprecedented changes in the way that states were conducting their pretrial release. The same was true of um, state declarations of emergency. Uh, For much of our history, the way emergencies are declared and the reason that they're declared are natural or man-made disasters. Um, In some cases, things like riots, uh, but in a lot of cases, tornadoes, hurricanes are the reasons that uh, declarations of emergency are are declared. They're temporary in their time. They're um, regionally uh, restricted in one shape or another. This was the first time in modern American history that not only did you have 
many states doing statewide declarations of emergency, but they uh, went on for long periods of time. Uh, many states still have them in place um, and all states were doing them. And so we sat down with the basic questions of, are there best practices here around declarations of emergency? And uh, from my vantage point, uh, I very much consider myself a Madisonian when it comes to governance. I believe that checks and balances, vertical and horizontal, are good for governance, are good for policy. And what declarations of emergency do is they remove that checks and balances from the policy crafting process. And of course, the reason that, that states grant that emergency declaration power to governors in the first place is because we recognize that there are instances in which uh, we need quick and decisive action, and therefore, uh, it makes sense to vest one man or woman with the ability to make quick and wide, wide decisions. But that as time goes on and as the nature of the emergency, if it does not dissipate entirely, it certainly changes, that the policy decisions uh, are best made when those checks and balances are reinstituted and put back in place. And so what we found was that a number of states uh, had legislative checks after particular periods of time uh, as it relates to emergency declarations, that a number of states uh, exempted certain uh, either industries or, or traditionally things that you find in the Bill of Rights, whether it be churches or federal firearms dealers, things like that, from declarations of emergency. And so the recommendation we made was that the legislature uh, participate in the process once a, a declaration of emergency is declared after a specified period of time. Um, states range uh, from as, as few as 15 days to as many as 60 days uh, in the states that have these kinds of checks already. And so the most common was 28 or 30 days. So our recommendation is for 30 days, but, but that is not a number that, um, that has a, a science behind it other than Say that that's what the, the plurality of other states are doing. Um, and that at that point, that, that um, our House and Senate ratified that declaration of emergency uh, if it is to continue. Um, this is complicated some in a state like ours where we have a part-time legislature, but uh, a pretty easy fix there given that uh, the declaration of emergency statute is a creation of statute and it gives to the governor extraordinary power, um, it is reasonable for the legislature to then require that in order to exercise that extraordinary power, that the governor come back to the legislature uh, and, and as it relates to the, the part-time nature of the legislature, call the legislature in for a special session if need be, should they not be in session, uh, to continue to exercise that power. How, how does the emergency authority given Kentucky's governor compare to that in general to other states? Is it greater authority, more discretion? Um, so it, it's generally on par. Um, there are some states that have more narrow definitions of what constitutes an emergency. Uh, the other thing that we looked at in this was to what extent the governor in uh, a state of emergency can amend statutes and regulations. Um, most states explicitly allow for the governor to, uh, or I should say, I believe it's a plurality of states allow for the governor to uh, amend regulations or statutes uh, when an emergency is declared. There are a number of states where the governor can uh, amend regulations, but not statutes. Uh, and then there are a number of states that are ambiguous or not explicit in what they um, what they grant to the governor. Uh, a review of those states, not that was not done by us, but that is cited in the piece, uh, categorizes Kentucky as that sort of ambiguous third category. And I believe part of that is because uh, it seems that the governor is given the ability to uh, replace statutes or regulations with sort of affirmative orders. Um, uh, it shall not be X, it shall be Y when X was the statute or regulation before. What is unclear uh, that other uh, statutes make clear in other states is whether or not the governor can just sort of suspend a statute or regulation for a period of time. Um, and so that's one of the other recommendations that we make that the legislature 
uh, regardless of, of which way they go, that they actually clarify that to determine um, with with a level of clarity what what they're actually handing over to the governor's office uh, when an emergency is declared. In a pandemic, a public health threat like we've experienced for since March, uh, how should state government and public health authorities then respond uh, to the public health authority or public health threats? Uh, what authority should they be given uh, yeah. from yeah. from the perspective of exercising executive authority? Yeah, um, I, I think the first thing that they should do is the, the very reason that we have declarations of emergency in the first place, that is to act swiftly and decisively. Um, when we were in that 15 days to flatten the curve period, 30 days to flatten the curve period, uh, it is, I think, excusable, uh, not only in the Commonwealth, but across the country, for governors to have made the wrong decision, for governors to have have perhaps uh, used an ax where a scalpel would have been beneficial. Because again, the, the purpose there and the goal there is to say, um, we are going to act swiftly, decisively, and and do what we can to curb this uh, this pandemic. Uh, what I think it is also reasonable and and crucial for citizens to then expect of government, whether it be a, a governor via an executive order or government through the traditional policymaking process, is to be agile and adjust to the facts as they come in. Um, a senior fellow of ours, Paul Coombs, who's a professor emeritus from the University of Louisville uh, in economics, uh, was putting out data that indicated basically around Easter, we had enough data to know who was high risk, what, what policies were detrimental. One of the things that governors sort of all, all across the country got wrong was putting individuals who were in nursing homes and tested positive for coronavirus back into nursing homes. Um, a, giant overrepresentation of coronavirus deaths in this country have come from nursing homes. And so that's one of the policy things that we got wrong and we should be able to adjust to and not make that mistake again. Uh, the same is true of the restrictions on business and, and schooling. Uh, if you are young and, and otherwise healthy and uh, don't have any of these sort of comorbidities, uh, then it is as important as a matter of beating this pandemic that you get back to work in an environment that is ultimately safe and and those kinds of things as it is that we protect those who are most vulnerable and most likely to die from this disease. Um, so I, I think it's appropriate for citizens to expect that, that government can walk and chew gum at the same time, that uh, you can be swift and decisive and make some mistakes but that as things go on, that you adjust and you're constantly recalculating and recalibrating uh, how you do things. Do you think, uh, Josh, that Kentucky governors of both parties have exceeded their authority in issuing executive orders? Obviously, prior governors haven't issued orders on pandemics, but uh, in the context of even re reorganizing state government, replacing state boards and commissions and and other areas of uh, executive branch authority. Yeah, I think that boards and commissions in particular have become political footballs in a way that is detrimental to policymaking. Um, regardless of the legal merits of the reorganization of the State Board of Education uh, and the attempts by both the co current governor and previous governor to, to do that, to sort of remake the State Board of Education in their image, uh, I think that is bad for public policy in this state. And so anytime that uh, a policymaking body like that is subject to the political whims of the moment, uh, absent structures that, that prevent that, that it's bad for policymaking. And I think that that's a particular board in this state that, that governors of both parties have behaved uh, inappropriately towards, uh, and it's ultimately education policy uh, and the education of our children that will suffer because of that. Pegasus also has prepared a number of studies, I think through the years on public education. Uh, and what are some of the recommendations that uh, you have made with regard to our educational system, uh, PK 
P through 12, as well as uh, higher education? Yeah, so I, I am not an education policy expert by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I do rely on our folks that do that kind of work. Uh, the most recent publication that we have on education was done by an outside expert um, on the impact that uh, charter schools could have uh, on Louisville specifically. Um, one of the things about education policy, and this is true of all public goods or services, is that a one size fits all approach uh, will almost always result in inequities uh, and uh, your policy lacking. And so here in Louisville, uh, we are one of the, the largest urban areas in the country where uh, students do not have access to public charter schools. Uh, that is to the detriment of not only the students and young people of Louisville, but ultimately to the business community and taxpayers of Louisville. Um, Dr. DeAngelis's report finds uh, huge potential economic benefits to the city of Louisville uh, and to the Commonwealth of Kentucky should Louisville experience just national averages in terms of achievement gains, in terms of uh, academic attainment gains uh, that other cities have experienced, uh, other cities of Louisville size have experienced uh, when public charter schools are an option for students. Um, there are a number of other things as a matter of curriculum and as a matter of academic standards that are coming down the line for us, uh, but we generally don't talk about research as it's being done. But as that comes out, uh, I think that that's stuff that folks will really uh, appreciate in terms of broader education conversations. Criminal justice, I think, has been your area of study and uh, particular expertise in, in reform. What are some of the areas of reform that uh, are needed uh, from your study and that of the Institute in Kentucky's criminal justice system? So when I moved here four, four years ago, the two most glaring issues in criminal justice in this state were crowding in our county jails and homicides in Louisville. Mm. As it relates to crowding in our county jails, uh, in large part because of coronavirus and, and policy and procedure changes that were put in place because of coronavirus. Our county jails, I testified before a, a joint interim local government committee about a year ago on this, our county jails were at 124% of design capacity. Uh, today, they are at about 84% of design capacity. So we've seen significant reductions in county jail crowding again, due in large part to changes because of coronavirus. And so uh, I never, uh, you know, put the plaque up and call an issue solved, but that issue in part because of a response to the moment has seen significant improvement. And so now it's a question of maintaining some of those policy and procedure mm -hmm. changes or making sure that the individuals who have been released from county jails don't uh, recidivate or find themselves back in uh, prison because they've committed a new offense or violated a term of probation or parole. As to the question of homicides in Louisville, there has not been that same progress. Uh, here in Louisville, uh, we've had 107 homicides this year. Uh, Louisville has eclipsed 105 homicides only, uh, four, only three times previous to this, uh, once in 1971, once in 2016 and once in 2017, and we now again have in 2020. So 75% uh, of the times that we have eclipsed um, 105 homicides been in the last five years. There is still much work to be done there. Um, our U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Kentucky, Russell Coleman, has put a tremendous amount of energy and effort and resources into this question. Um, state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies and nonprofits are collaborating in a way that when I first moved here, I, I would have thought was impossible. And so my hope is through best practices like focused deterrence policing and, and a number of other initiatives that um, within the next couple of years, we can see that issue turn back as well. Uh, but those were the two biggest issues when I moved here. Uh, coronavirus has sort of forced the hand on the jail question but there is still much, much to be done on the homicides and the question. 
What does Pegasus have to say about tax reform, a much uh, discussed issue in Kentucky with very little action? Yeah. So um, we were, were pretty integral in the tax reform package a number of years ago. Uh, our, our basic philosophy on taxation is to transition our taxing base away from production side taxes and towards consumption side taxes. Um, there's a, a lively debate on the right about whether uh, the Tennessee model is preferable or the sort of Indiana model is preferable, which is sort of funny because we're sandwiched between those two states. We're sandwiched between the two preferable models. Uh, what Tennessee has done is moved almost entirely to a consumption-based sales tax system. There are local sales taxes, there are state sales taxes. That's the way revenue is generated. Uh, Indiana has a much more diverse tax, tax structure, but as a result has low rates for income, property, and and sales tax and so um either of those systems would be preferable to the one that we have now in kentucky the question is which direction do we ultimately want to move in uh, i am also of the opinion and this is how we deal with policy generally at pegasus is that incrementalism is the appropriate way to go um, if you take small steps every legislative session uh, you look back 10 years and the system is entirely different than it was before. That's as true in tax policy as it is in criminal justice policy. Time for just one very quick response to a final question. Uh, what do you think is the number one issue going into the 2021 General Assembly session, other than the, the budget, obviously? Yeah, so obviously the budget's a big one, given the unique nature of, of having to craft a one-year budget in an off-year session. Um, I do think that uh, ARS 39A, which is uh, declarations of emergency, will get significant legislative attention. Um, and the final thing is that we are a state that is still very much struggling uh, with a drug and addiction crisis. And so I think you will probably see movement and interest in that question uh, from policymakers. Josh Crawford, director of the uh, Pegasus Institute, thank you for your time and uh, look forward to future opportunities for further dialogue on public issues. Thank this you. is John Chowning with uh, Campbellsville University, thanking Josh Crawford and thanking our audience for being with us once again for dialogue on public issues. Mm -hmm.